Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Cloud Security and DevOps Automation, Keys for Modern Security Success. My name is Carol Off of SANS, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Eric Johnson, Certified SANS Instructor. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Eric. Thank you, Carol. Uh, this is Eric Johnson. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. So if, if you can or if the audio goes out or anything like that, feel free to drop a message into the chat window and at least let me know so I don't keep going on without you. Uh, it, what you should see up on the screen is the intro slide. Today's topic, or at least what you showed up for, is to talk about cloud security and DevOps automation. And we're going to cover what I feel are four keys to modern security success, which are really prerequisites to what you need to be doing in the world of DevOps in order to track and monitor uh, your resources, whether in the cloud or whether on-prem. We'll talk about lots of examples of both. Many of these topics are covered as part of the SANS SEC 540 Cloud Security and DevOps Automation course, which myself and Jim Bird and Ben Allen and Frank Kim all author together. The next three runs of this I've, I've got at the bottom of the slide. So I will be out at SANS Security West in uh, it's actually supposed to be San Diego, California, from May 9th to the 13th. Uh, we've also got a run in Washington, D.C. this summer. And then Greg Leonard is teaching out in Canberra in Australia. If any of you can get some approvals for management to take a flight down to Canberra to hang out with Greg for a week, that'd probably be a pretty good little summer vacation to pack in there. So that's where you can find us, at least as we progress through. Uh, let me flip the slide here. So our curriculum course, as we keep evolving, you'll, uh, this is from our latest poster, which I'll give you a link to this here in a little bit. Uh, we've got a few new courses in here. Uh, SEC 540 is the one I was just referring to. Dave Shackelford released a SEC 545 course, which is a nice prerequisite to 540, in my opinion. If you've got no experience with the cloud, that's a really good course on security architecture and operations. So those are kind of the new additions to our roadmap, at least probably since the last time you checked in on us. I'll go ahead and give you my contact information and some background here real quick. Uh, my primary background stems out of corporate America, at least uh, the first 10 years of my career. I was with a financial institution doing mostly application development and uh, application security audits on all internet facing systems which kind of led me into static analysis and automating security tools and then you know DevSecOps really lends itself to that experience pretty well from a source code perspective uh, we've also as i branched out from corporate american did independent consulting uh, did lots of web app and mobile app testing Right now, I'm working at a small startup called Puma Security, where we focus on integrating security into the pre-commit, which is as engineers are writing code phase of DevOps, as well as in the commit phase, which is when we can actually scan code and get vulnerabilities to show up in automated build pipelines. So that's what I spend most of my time on when I'm not working on courseware or teaching for the SANS Institute. My Education and training is on the slide. Uh, I went to Iowa State University. Uh, I got a master's of in, in information assurance and a bachelor's in computer engineering. Uh, I've taken a couple of the AWS certification exams, CISSP, uh, GS, GSSP for so secure software programming, as well as web app pen testing. So uh, pretty v a wide variety of topics that I like to play around in in the working world. Uh, my contact info is on the slide. You can find me at emjohn20 on Twitter. If you have questions after the webcast or have any questions you'd like to throw out there um, going down the road. With that, 
let's take a look at our agenda today. So I'm going to kind of go through three, uh, five main sections. Uh, we'll go into some cloud and DevOps practices. I'll give you some resources so you can kind of take a look at uh, potentially how you can work some of these things into your life cycle. And then we'll go through four key controls, which I've titled the paved road, continuous integration and continuous security controls. We'll talk about managing supply chain security as well as continuous security compliance. So kicking off the first section here, uh, this meme cracks me up. It's, uh, it's out in kind of the meme gen generator side. I'm not even sure really who created it, but it's a really accurate representation of all of the various viewpoints of what DevSecOps is all about. You've got a unicorn, you've got a horse, you've got kind of a fire-breathing dragon, and then there's this awesome cat that's holding, you know, this large gold gun. So this kind of represents all of the different folks that are in working, quote, in DevSecOps. It means a lot of different things to a lot of people. The security side of this really is all about security becoming more agile as DevOps delivers changes faster out to the world. And based on which group you're in, whether it's dev or ops or cloud, your job kind of changes. So if you look from the application perspective, this is primarily pretty easy to accomplish if you've been in AppSec for a while. You know, DevSecOp largely just equals application security to folks coming out of that space. You've got OWASP and lots of resources and lots of tools that have been able to be automated for quite a while. If you look at it from a different perspective, so leave the apps aside, you know, Agile kind of exploded into the world and allows us, allowed us to deliver application changes relatively quickly. But the operations side of DevOps is often left out. And if ops can't move as quickly as app does or dev does, there's still a bottleneck there. So operationally, Infrastructure as code allows you to move quickly and build and provision cloud networks. And it's really all about network security teams taking on the same model where they're leveraging DevOps tools to maybe automate network scans, look for traffic anomalies, manage their firewalls and switches, you know, all in infrastructure code and deliver them out to the organization through continuous integration and delivery. You could even bring this down into the maybe the SOC or the incident response realm. Um, I sat in a talk from Chris Roth from Red Canary last year at our DevOps Summit, which is in Denver. It'll actually be in Denver this coming November. There'll be some good speakers there, but Chris works for Red Canary, and they went into how they write AV signatures, detectors in YAML, and they actually automate test cases and automatically run those with a tool called RSpec for their acceptance testing in pushing Red Canary updates out to the InfoSec world. So it's a really nice example of how it's not just about dev. DevSecOps is really for security and operations, and the slide kind of, kind of sums it up. Whatever it is that you're trying to achieve, it's really about looking at it from a security perspective, making that discussion a first class problem, and then making folks on the security team that have the knowledge to do some of the automation required a first class participant in the overall project. Uh, doing so, I've seen lots of organizations where dev and ops and sec actually end up working on the same team in a sense, and they're part of kind of this small six to eight person team that really just takes the product or project or whatever it is from end to end, from inception all the way to tearing it down in their environment. So the title of this, and the slide has all the different memes that you've kind of seen wrapped around this, is really just improving a workflow to incrementally improve security along the way. So if you're shooting for DevSecOps, it's a really loaded concept and narrowing it down can really help you figure out what problems you want to tackle first in this space. To help folks with that, what we did uh, at SANS, we created this resource and we call it the Secure DevOps Practices Poster. Uh, the link is in the slide. So it's out there at sans.org slash u slash OGX, which is up there in the title. So you can get to it from that short link and download the soft copy. 
a lot of our live events uh, kind of hand this poster out, you know, on the big poster tables, the swag tables, et cetera. So if you're at a live event, you can probably get a printed copy of this. But we've enhanced it this year. Uh, last year on the right-hand side, we released what we call the Secure DevOps tool chain, which has a number of open source tools related to pre-commit, commit, acceptance, production, and operations, and all of the different open source tools that we could find that fit into all of the key security controls that should be in the entire workflow. Uh, so that's been updated a little bit. We also introduced on the left-hand side a new cloud security top 10 list for you organizations that are maybe moving into the cloud or dealing with cloud security on a regular basis. Uh, this was released at a SANS Cloud Insecurity Summit by Ben Hagen with some contributor uh, contributions from Mark Hillich and some other folks that are on the slide. So that's kind of a new top 10 things to think about if you're dealing with cloud security, as well as Ori Siegel's uh, from PureSec, his serverless security top 10 list, which since we printed this even has evolved into a new OWASP top 10 for serverless security project, which I believe is out in the alpha uh, world out in OWASP's project list. So that serverless security top 10 list is something that's also been rapidly expanding in this ecosystem as we shift our serverless functions out into the cloud to kind of avoid having to babysit and maintain servers all the time. So a really good resource there. Feel free to download that and kind of use that in your organization to help build out your program. Some things to think about, which is in that right-hand side, the actual controls that are covered with all of those different open source tools are summarized on this slide. There's 20 different controls to think about. And as you look at this critical security controls list for cloud and DevOps, what always jumps out to me is that folks think that they can just flip a button or push the easy button in a sense and become DevSecOps overnight. Achieving all 20 of these controls is a years long journey. What I want to talk about today is to start achieving these 20 critical security controls, what do you need to do ahead of time in order to actually prepare yourself to manage this or to deal with this tech? So think back to this. As we go through each of these, I'll give you the four prerequisites over the next four sections, and then you can start picking these off one by one. We actually cover a lot of them as part of the four paved roads as well, or the four prerequisites. I gave away my next slide. So my first key to modern security success is really before you even write a single line of code, what's the first thing that needs to happen? What we call that, or at least in our course, and this is something that's been popularized by Netflix and Amazon and some of the other companies out there is really just called building the paved road. So here's the meme, right, or a picture of a very dangerous looking mountain. And there's this road with a guardrail on it that's supposed to stop you from falling off. And what this really means from a DevSecOps perspective is that before you actually start moving quickly, you need to have this paved, paved road with a guardrail created to accomplish whatever the task is. And if you look at it, from the different perspectives, there's tons of different work here, tons of different tools that are going to be involved, but it's really all about laying down that iteration zero where you build this template for the engineers to start with. So we take the uptime or the upfront time to build the template, which gives you a repeatable. It has to be code driven, so you can basically point and shoot this template into any environment and do it with a very good assurance that it's going to be secure by default out of the box, which will let you succeed in the long term going forward. So operations, we'll talk about operations first here. And it's really all about creating infrastructure code. And that could be cloud infrastructure. It could be on-prem infrastructure. It could be just building gold images, but it's really being able to do that with an automated pipeline so that development can move faster. The development templates, we've had these for a while. 
Dev is really the key behind DevOps. So they've got secure templates for web, for APIs, for front end, for serverless. We'll talk about some examples there. From a security perspective, this is relatively new to InfoSec, but it's all about learning the continuous integration tools, how these pipeline scans work, and then starting to adapt and write our own security focused unit acceptance test production assertions. What we can end up with is a really cool set of security controls inside of the paved roads for dev and for ops to generate continuous security compliance for us. So that's what you need to be thinking of as you build out these various paved roads. So let's talk operations first. Now, operations has a ton of tools in, at their fingertips that we have not had for quite a while, or at least in a legacy infrastructure, where we can actually leverage code templates to create a virtual machine, to create a network infrastructure, to even provision your on-prem network devices. So examples of this could include Chef or Puppet or Ansible. In the world of Ansible, they've got really good support for provisioning on-prem network devices. So imagine this world where traditionally what we always think of when you have to change a firewall rule, a lot of it is logging into some sort of administrative web portal and changing the rule. And then if you've got 500 different firewalls, you've got to log into potentially each of those. It depends on the vendor and how the product is designed, but potentially log into 500 web interfaces change the rule exactly the same every single time and hope we don't push the wrong button or screw it up. In the more modern operations paved road, we could leverage something like Ansible and write actual Ansible playbooks to provision an F5 firewall with all of the rules and all of the configuration predefined in a code template and that's checked into version control. And when you check into version control, that kicks off an infrastructure pipeline, which might lint the YAML and actually make sure that it's valid. And if that step passes, maybe we'll provision the change out to one firewall so we can actually run some automated acceptance tests against that firewall and make sure the change did what we want it to do. And if all goes well, the production step would be deploying that firewall change out to all 500 of those firewalls using Ansible to provision them with this one template. So you're guaranteed you've got repeatability and consistency across the entire network. And building out that operations paved road allows network and network security to move as quickly and as agile as dev and ops want to in a DevOps world. So that's just an example of what that can look like. Now replaying that, you've got the ability to patch and or create gold images using Chef, Puppet, and Ansible as well. That could be on-prem, it could be cloud-hosted, but you've got the ability to create those gold images that then maybe become available inside of your Amazon or your Azure kind of virtual machine marketplaces, and all of the app teams can inherit from those. The same sort of pipeline could scan it for CIS benchmark compliance, run automated acceptance tests to make sure that all of the packages and all of the versions are what they should be before you release that goal image. Similarly, for your Docker base images, you could use the same tooling to create all of your Docker base images that maybe have your agents installed or have your twist locks or your Aqua security agents pre-configured so they can join out and talk to your centralized kind of administration consoles for managing your container fleets. You can completely deploy your cloud infrastructure in code, whether it's with Terraform or whether it's cloud formation. You can use the same process to build and manage your entire cloud infrastructure, your API gateways, your functions as a service. All of that is kind of the modern engineering process for the operational teams going forward. It sounds exciting, right? And it's powerful if you can make it work. So I'm just going to give you an example. Our organization, we run a lot of different container clusters in production. All of them are built out using infrastructure as code, similar to what I'm showing you on the slide. Now, this is a launch configuration that creates a virtual machine that's hidden behind a load balancer. And anytime an image or a VM dies or we 
change this configuration. It just rolls the whole new fleet of VMs out into the cloud infrastructure. Now, back in February, I'm going to say maybe like the second week of February, we had a really interesting CVE pop up in the Docker world. And it was a vulnerability in the Run C library, which actually allowed us to gain access to the Docker host and potentially remote code execution in a Dockerized or containerized environment. So that's a zero day. And suddenly you're looking around at your architecture and your systems trying to figure out, okay, where do we have Docker running? And how do I patch Docker? I have to actually go patch this vulnerability in the Run C library. Traditionally, we've got lots of admins that are SSHing the boxes and making updates and doing all these things manually. What we did in our organization, we have one centralized template that creates these, log, or these launch configurations. And if you're looking at the slide, line five, that's the image ID. That is that magic Amazon AMI gold image that we are actually launching. And all we had to do, and this is a perfect example of a DevOps with security involved style paid road, is we know we need to patch the gold image. So it's as simple as a git clone to pull down our infrastructure code and edit to this file. And we change this image ID to the new patched gold image ID that is fixed this vulnerability. And then we just do a git add, a git commit, and a git push which kicks off an automated pipeline, which then provisions an acceptance environment, makes sure that the vulnerability is patched in that environment. And if all is well, the pipeline will roll those changes out into the production cloud environments, rolling out new instances that are patched and killing off the old ones and maintaining 100% uptime in the process. So on our side, patching that run C vulnerability in the world of Docker was probably in total about an hour's worth of effort to go patch several hundred different VMs that are running out in the cloud just by changing one line of code. Now there's other things to think about in this template. And I have a slide we go over in class where we say, look, you've got to worry about least privileged here, admin access, who's got access to that key on line seven, what the network configuration is defined on lines eight and nine, potentially in the user data, are we affecting supply chain security by installing packages and things of that nature? The best part about this is it's all stored in version control. And by using version control as part of the paved road, we get full visibility into all changes that were made to the system. We get visibility in the potential to apply a Git flow strategy which can allow us to enforce merge requests or pull requests as we go into the develop and the master branches, which require code reviews to happen. So there's a lot you can gain by building out your paved road templates. And that's just for the operational fun. On the development side, we kind of switch gears here. This is different code, completely separate goal here. But if you're struggling with application security, building out the dev paved road is the number one prerequisite I can hand off to you. Now, this is hard because you've got potentially platforms written in Node, Django, Spring Boot, .NET Core, Ruby. You might just have functions in PowerShell that are performing these types of jobs. You might have functions in Java. It just all depends on what your organization is using. But if you pick the one that's gonna gain you the most amount of coverage. So let's say that 60% of your applications are written in some sort of a .NET Core stack. What you might want to do is start with that and build a template out. If it's an API-based template, you can, on startup, you can pre-configure HTTPS. You can turn authentication and authorization on. You can configure password management or any sort of single sign-on configuration. You can give examples on how to read secrets, maybe from the Azure vault or from the Amazon KMS vault. Do all of the things in that template that the engineers often struggle with from a security perspective and make it really difficult for them to turn those things off or change them. Suddenly, you've now got a baseline of all sorts of known good things and then the engineers 
can just write code where you've got this comment right in the middle that says implement your API here and don't change anything else. You can also include common vulnerabilities that you may have written for performing crypto operations, data validation, logging, encoding. All of those centralized security packages can be pre-referenced in the template, making it really simple to do things the right way. So here is a very basic example that just performs a bunch of pre-configured security protections inside of a .NET Core template. It turns authentication on, it sets up password complexity on that first block from line three to line five. It then adds an authorization filter on lines nine and 10, where it says every single entry point into this entire service is protected with authorization. Now engineers have to opt out to make any of the APIs accessible anonymously. 15 is a very simple way to force HTTPS connections. Line 16 is invoking a security headers package that pre-configures the API or the web tier with content security policy and the strict transport security headers and X-frame options and all of those kind of OWASP style security headers that we can use to tell the browser to protect our end users as they're interacting with our system. We can set all of this ahead of time in our paved road template taking the responsibility off of the engineers and just letting security handle that and they'll start with this baseline. So just another example of that iteration zero upfront effort that can go a long way towards securing the dev side of the DevSecOps wheelhouse. So we've got the paved road covered. Hopefully you're feeling pretty good about that. That's a lot of work. That is months and months of effort. Once you get to the point of having those paved roads ready, prerequisite number two is learn to love continuous integration and continuous delivery security controls. You have to understand the CI and CD tools first, and there's a lot of them. You might be in one pocket of your organization and have Jenkins involved. You might be in another pocket of the organization that's using Azure DevOps, for example. You might be in another pocket that's using Team City or Circle CI or Octopus. There's lots and lots of different tools out there that perform the same sort of functionality. The big goal here from continuous integrations perspective is to understand that these are way more powerful than just a development tool. And oftentimes, as we go through CI and CD tools in our class for five straight days over the course of the week, usually a few days in, a lot of the students that take this, suddenly a light bulb clicks. And they'll say, you know what? I had this manual forensics process that I do to maybe perform analysis after I get an image of a drive or something of that nature. They've got all of these tools. And the big question is, is can you drive the tool from a command line interface or from a REST API? Because if you can, every single tool is pluggable into a continuous integration pipeline, such as the one that I'm showing you up on the slide. These tools allow you to invoke a command line interface or make a REST call, and all they do is they take some sort of process or some sort of set of steps and they turn it into a repeatable workflow and they just orchestrate the workflow and make sure that all of the steps happen in the right order. On the slide, what you're staring at, that's a cloud infrastructure pipeline. That has absolutely zero application code inside of it. And what that's doing is it's taking roughly probably 15 different cloud templates, and it's building out a production environment with two subnets, with knackles and security group rules, defining traffic flow between the two subnets. It's fronting the public subnet with a load balancer. It's creating automated pipelines that deploy container clusters out to the individual public and private subnets. It's creating a cloud front distribution. It's setting up a CDN. It's setting up logging. It's doing all of this inside of an AWS account. And Jenkins, which is who is orchestrating this pipeline behind the scenes, is just making sure that everything that needs to happen is happening in the right order, 
And if any of those steps fail, the pipeline stops and you know you have something to go in there and fix. And that's all the continuous integration tools purpose is, is to just orchestrate a workflow. Now by setting this up, you get some very cool benefits. And I mentioned tracking and auditing via version control. The first step to this entire workflow typically is when you commit some sort of change into your repository. In that repository, such as GitLab or GitHub or Bitbucket, whatever you're using, you've got the ability to perform a merge request inside of there, which is where you get to review all of the code that is changing. Now, this is a really powerful security control from a peer review perspective. It provides you with some separation of duties and the ability to say, okay, is Eric trying to put a backdoor in production? And if, it, if I am, not that I would ever do that, you can put a comment in here and say, nope, this merge request is being denied. You have to fix this, 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 and this before you can actually get this into a live environment. You can also see who changed code, when it changed. You can potentially perform a high-risk code reviews using the same methodology. On the slide, what you're staring at, I would say this is high-risk code. This is actually a patch that we're putting in place. And this is where we're taking a older ELB security policy that had TLS 1.0 enabled, and we're upgrading it to the newer policy for 2017, which is enabling only TLS 1.2. So that's a security patch in flight. And we're able to do a review on that and see who did that, when it happened, and we can push the green go button if we're happy with it. And that will allow the pipeline to process this change. If it doesn't get past this peer review, it never enters production. Now, popping off to the next phase, the pipeline is also very good at performing automated tests. This can be unit tests. They can be performing just a very non-functional security scan with a tool like Zap, generating an audit report, maybe with a tool like OSCAP, for example, and delivering that feedback to you displayed as very nicely formatted unit test results. So what you're staring at on the slide is a CFN NAG scan. Now the infrastructure pipeline I showed you on the previous slide, if everything gets in there and it starts working, we can actually enable testing and we can basically lint and or just perform a quick code scan of the cloud formation templates, run that scanner, and we can output them to a format that is digestible by this pipeline, which is typically X unit is probably the most common test results format across all of the different continuous integration tools. And then the pipeline can read that XML file and say, hey, look, seven of these failed. And we know that we maybe need to fix all of these before the pipeline should be able to deploy out to a live environment. So you're seeing results on the screen from our code that's saying, hey, look, we don't have logging turned on on one of our CDNs. We've got a very permissive role. Do we need to actually set up an exception for that? We've got a public facing bucket, which often happens in the real world. And we see that over and over in the news. Running a very simple infrastructure code scanner can stop that before it ever starts. Now there's other tools out there. Puppet Lint Security is another good tool for scanning puppet code for the same sorts of security vulnerabilities. TerraScan can scan for Terraform. And then we can just perform our own custom high-risk code checks by simply matching up checksums of the old version versus the current one. And we can stop a build if some piece of high-risk code actually is modified. Continuing down the line, you can also perform just post-production or maybe post-acceptance phase compliance scans. So maybe you always need your infrastructure to be AWS CIS benchmark compliant. And you can run a scanner and you'll notice here, we've got the ability to archive these compliance artifacts. So they're always attached to a build. So we always have CFN NAGS results. And then below, I've actually just added in the AWS CIS benchmarks as well. And we can always look at this and go back and say, we were CIS benchmark compliant, our whole AWS environment on every single release. And if something turns to a fail, we can stop the build. So that gives you a nice 
recap of just continuous integration tools, what their actual features and capabilities are. Once you have that set up, then you can start building more security into the mix. Number three, we've titled supply chain security. And in my opinion, this is probably one of the largest issues that we are facing as far as IT security at the moment. There are simply so many open source libraries or images or packages out there in the world that it's very, very difficult to keep an inventory on those and figure out what is secure and what is not. Now, there's lots of logos on the slide. So we'll start with the more traditional version of supply chain security, which is more on the application side. It's pretty much summarized by dissecting all of our NuGet packages or our Maven packages that our apps might be referencing, your node packages, and saying, what are we referencing? Are there vulnerabilities in those components? And checking them against known vulnerability databases to see if we need to upgrade to the latest and greatest version. So that sort of software composition analysis has been around for many, many, many years. The interesting side is all of the other logos on there which have been evolving rapidly. So you look at the top to the Azure marketplace and the AWS marketplace where suddenly strangers on the internet can publish gold images to the marketplace. And if you're not careful, you can just download and install that golden image into your cloud account and maybe use it to power your entire organization. Now, what percentage of those gold images do you think contain malware or libraries with known vulnerabilities inside of them? So we have to be very careful about where we download our cloud virtual machine images from. Very similarly, Docker. The Docker registry, the public facing Docker registry has tons and tons of gold images with malware in them, as well as ones with vulnerable libraries. So now we have to inspect that from statement and all of our Docker files. We need to figure out, okay, where is that gold image or that Docker image from? Who's the publisher for that? Has it actually been scanned for vulnerabilities? So just another attack surface on the supply chain side there. It gets even more interesting where you've got the Chef Supermarket and the Puppet Forge, which are open source repositories of infrastructure code. So you can actually go down to the Chef Supermarket and download a gold image for your network from some stranger on the internet and say, well, I'm sure they wrote good code. There wouldn't be any vulnerabilities in this, would there? And you have to think about where we got those and we have to review those as well. It gets even more exciting. There's actually an AWS WAF rule marketplace. So you can actually go download rules for the AWS WAF from external accounts. So now you have to worry about vetting who wrote my WAF rules for me. There's an AWS serverless application repository where folks can publish their own serverless functions and your engineers can just download those serverless functions into your AWS account and just run them. So now we have to worry about, well, did we write the serverless function or did somebody else write it? And can we be attacked through that serverless function. So this is just an area that is growing rapidly. It's kind of overwhelming, right? So we'll take a look at some scanning tools here. Some of these we can scan, other ones we just have to do it ourselves. So on the application side, the OWASP dependency check tool has been something that's maintained by Jeremy Long and a strong team over at OWASP. It can scan your Java, your .NET, your Ruby, your Python code, et cetera for composition and package dependencies. So very good job of that. Uh, Ruby's got bundler audit, NPM audit in the node world, PHP's got a security checker. Those are relatively straightforward to run on the application side as well as plug into your continuous integration pipelines. Aren't you glad we covered that in the section before this? Because now what I'm showing you is you can plug dependency check scan into a Jenkins pipeline and you can actually gain a nice list of all of the different vulnerabilities that your references are vulnerable to and make a decision based on that data before you choose to deploy out into a live environment. So this allows you to continuously perform supply chain scans. This is a Java application and make a decision before it goes live. 
switching gears, same drill on the Docker container image side. Now it's interesting, I spoke about Docker a bit back at a conference in Australia last summer, and we had a, maybe a room of 300 people, and I kind of asked who's scanning their images, their open source, maybe container images that they downloaded and then customized with an actual Docker security scanning tool. And I think maybe only two or three people in the entire room knew that you could or were actually doing that in their environment. So we can run a couple of great open source tools here. Encore is an open source tool that's out there that you can run. It does a really good job. I'll show you a screenshot of that here in a minute. Uh, we've also got Falco. And then Claire is also a very good one that was open sourced by CoreOS, who if you have followed the market, got acquired by Red Hat, who got acquired by IBM. So I'm not really sure what the future of Claire is. Hopefully they keep it open source, but I haven't heard one way or the other if maybe that's going to be packaged up into the Redshift platform and, and bundled in as a scanner of some sort. But as of right now, you can run any of those at zero cost to gather vulnerabilities in your container images that are sitting out there in the world. And then once you run the scan locally and figure out the command, we turn right back around and we boost the strength of our automated build pipelines by now scanning Docker images and capturing vulnerability data before you publish that Docker image into your internal private registries, which the app teams are inheriting from. So this is in more of an operational pipeline where we can start to control the Docker image supply chain using the same sort of methodology. On the operation side, I mentioned downloading those maybe insecure or malware-ridden infrastructure templates from Chef or from Puppet's open source repositories, there's two projects you should know about if you're going to be using infrastructure code. The first one is DevSec. DevSec-IO is the URL. You can go out there. They've got a section which is all hardening templates. You can actually use an automated hardening framework for Puppet, Chef, and Ansible, they've got Linux, Windows, SSH, Docker support, et cetera, where you can actually go grab, okay, I need a Linux CIS benchmark Puppet manifest. Okay, here you go. You can download it and that gives you a place to start. They've got templates out there for Kubernetes servers, for Docker engines, for Nginx, Apache, MySQL, and you can go out there and just grab the correct template for the server that you're wanting to spin up. So that's a really good place to start if you're looking to you get pre-hardened, verified infrastructure templates for your organization. The second one, this is Puppet specific, but you can go out there and grab infrastructure Puppet templates that meet some of the more hardened DOD requirements such as NIST 853, DISA STIG, FIPS 140-2 for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So you can go grab some of those SEMP templates and check those out as well and know that they have been pretty well vetted by the security community. Now that project was commissioned by the NSA, so they're using that internally, uh, like all templates. Give them a good read and make sure they're doing what you think they should be doing before you launch them into your organization. But that's a pretty good set of operational templates for you to start with. The final thing I'll mention on supply chain security has to do with functions. Organizations are very quickly shifting their workloads into what we're calling functions as a service or serverless functions in the cloud. AWS at reInvent last year in December announced what they call Lambda layers. Now this is actually kind of an interesting technology, but what it allows you to do is to sideload packages into a shared directory that your function can reference that has preloaded libraries in it. So let's say I've got a node function and I have five packages that I need that node function to actually be able to consume at runtime. In the old world, I had to zip up all of the actual packages and my own function inside of the same zip file and deploy that function out the door. In the new world, I could inject those five packages into the function via a layer. And now all I have to do is just deploy my function. So I don't have to include any dependencies inside of the function itself. Now this gets kind of interesting. 
So what you could do, let's talk about the good first. From the blue team perspective, you could actually strip all of the external package references from all of your function deployments enforce all of those references to come in through in a layer through a layer that you own and that you maintain so you actually know i've approved and vetted every single node package in here every version i've scanned with npm audit i know there's not vulnerabilities the function is not including any of that on its own so it gives you full control over dependency management inside of the function so that's a good thing the other interesting thing is that they actually made the ability for you to share a layer with other AWS accounts. So this is a red team perspective, but in theory, I could create a layer with tons of libraries in it that are vulnerable with all sorts of malware inside of them. And then I could trick or convince some engineer to use my layer and run their function with my code inside of it. So there's a, more red team perspective of side loading evil code also through layers so there's good and the bad so we have to be very careful about who we are using as our layers supplier now but then we've also got vendors that are doing some really cool work here such as PureSec. this is a completely open source project called function shield and what it does is it works i think in google and in aws and you can include their function shield library and stand it up inside your code, and you can actually harden the function's runtime environment. It does things like make the file system read-only, and it blocks outbound command and control connections, and does some other advanced things to actually harden your function's execution environment without you having to include any of that in your code itself. TwistLock, which is commercial, also has a add-on called Defender, which does something very similar, and that's just extending the supply chain security discussion into functions as a whole. And this conversation could go on and on and on and on. However, we've got one section left to cover and we'll have to switch to that. But just be aware that this is a massive problem in IT security across the board right now. Achieving continuous security compliance, hopefully kind of the wheels have been spinning in your heads over the last three sections of Everything we've talked about is really leveraging continuous security compliance. If you're running those scans in line inside of your continuous integration pipelines. So really what this is dealing with, this more kind of advanced prerequisite is let's leverage all these tools to test our servers, our applications, our infrastructure, our Docker images, whatever it is against your expected baseline for security and execute them all of the time on every single change to make sure that we either compliant still or we're not, we broke something. You can use pre-built checklists that are out there. We'll use some automated testing tools to maybe do this and make it a little easier on ourselves. There's some good ones out there. I'll circle or highlight the, the first one on the slide, which is called InSpec. InSpec very tightly overlaps with the DevSec IO project, which hosts a bunch of InSpec profiles. InSpec is commissioned by Chef, but DevSec has profiles that say, look, I can scan this Linux box with an InSpec profile to see if it's actually CIS level one benchmark for the Docker baseline. And it'll give you a really nice report that says if it is or if it isn't. You'll know every check or every test that failed just by running that automated scan, which you can display inside of your continuous integration pipeline. OpenSCAP is another great open source tool that lets you automate kind of OS level compliance scans. You can scan CentOS for PCI compliance, for example, or you can scan just a baseline Ubuntu profile against a, a Docker container. So you can actually run that against both the on-prem hosts and the container images themselves. Cloud Custodian is probably one of the best open source cloud compliance tools that's out there. This is maintained by Capital One, although the community supporting this is getting much larger. Capital One built this because they just truly didn't like how expensive, I'm guessing, AWS config is in the AWS cloud. So they wrote this to perform continuous desired state configuration against their AWS cloud. You can have policies that says no public facing buckets are allowed. And if somebody creates one, it detects it and just tears it down. 
the support for Azure and Google Cloud are probably still tagged as experimental, but the support is getting there. Scout Suite is from the NCC group. That's another great kind of compliance scanning tool for the three clouds. And then AWS has their own benchmark scanner. All of these can be run from the command line to generate compliance reports. An example of this is this inspect command. Now this is using Docker to run the scan. And then once the scan's done, we've generated our report, the container goes away. So we don't actually even have to maintain any sort of scanning server full time. We just use this Docker run command and we're mounting the current directory, which is the dollar PWD part to the share directory inside the container. We'll run the baseline command pointed at a certain container and we're saying, is this container compliant with the Linux baseline profile? And inside the report, you'll see these X's and these checks saying pass or fail. And you'll know where you need to go make modifications to the actual image in order to harden this and get it to be Linux baseline compliant. Extending that a step further is once you know how the command works, we can easily plug that into the build pipeline that's actually creating that Docker image, export those results into a JUnit format that process them with the pipeline. And now on every build, you've got the test results. We can see on the slide, we've got two failing test results that are new and we've got 51 existing. So you always have the baseline of what it was before and what it is now based on what we changed inside of that Docker image. And you can set that up to run on every single build of the Docker gold image. Flipping the slide one forward, this is just another example of continuous security scanning. This is using AWS config. And what it's doing is it installed the benchmark rules inside of the actual cloud account. So every single resource that's created is continuously being evaluated for the AWS CIS benchmark, and I'm seeing, and this is me running it against our lab account, we've got lots of non-compliant resources in here, lots of things that need to be fixed in our infrastructure code, and as you patch and deploy the environment through the Jenkins pipeline, you'll see these non-compliant resources start to disappear as you update and patch the code. So following that same pattern, we're gaining continuous security compliance. So that summarizes, at least in my opinion, four really important prerequisites. And we cover all of this in 540. I did wanna make this quick announcement before I open it up for questions with the few minutes that we've got left. Uh, starting at SecWest, we've actually upgraded 540 to include some bonus challenges. We'll be extending the course hours to run from five to 7 p.m. every night. So we can actually do some extra exercises and explore Azure cloud services in a little more detail. We'll actually use Terraform to create some Azure cloud services. We'll launch some Kubernetes services, explore blue-green deployment patterns, and the continuous net wars scoreboard will be up all week throughout the course, which allows us to hand out the new SEC 540 challenge coin, which one side of it is displayed on the slide here, which kind of has that meme feel to it that I showed you with the unicorn and the horse and obviously the cloud on it. So make sure to come check us out at one of the upcoming 540 events and all participants that show up do also receive the sticker of the challenge coin itself. So we're pretty excited to announce the release of this starting at SecWest. I'll flip to the final slide here. Some upcoming webcasts that go into some other topics that we would cover in 540. Um, on or around May 7th, David Hazar is going to be presenting Azure Infrastructure Automation. That'll have some Terraform content inside of it on how to create things in Azure. Frank Kim is going to be presenting a cloud security monitoring and operations automation talk, which will include some content on cloud custodian, if that topic is interesting to you. And then Mark Gieslin uh, in June will be presenting uh, just data protection in the cloud and talking through some of the services that you can use to get strong data protection inside of your cloud providers. So with that, that ties off today's content. Uh, Carol, I'll pass it back to you at this point. I believe we've got maybe a couple of minutes left for a couple of questions. 
So uh, if, if you send those to Carol, she can kind of facilitate the question and answers. Yes, uh, thanks, Eric. Yeah, go ahead and put those in the questions and do if you have any. Um, uh, one question came in, it says, any plan for an associated GX certification? Ah, we get that question a lot. Um, the, the answer is yes. Uh, GAC has sent a few people through the course and they are actively trying to get a pool of question writers together. This topic area, and if you've worked in the space long enough, I'm sure you know this already, but it moves quick. Um, we update the course five times a year and there's new content that really enters and leaves all the time, which is kind of a challenge for creating a consistent exam with a consistent pool of questions. I know that's been a challenge, and I know finding folks that understand dev, sec, and ops to write the questions has been a challenge. So they're working through all of those kinks, and at some point, uh, I'd, I'd have to check in on dates, maybe late this year or potentially earlier next year, I think they should have a certification, at least at the beta phase, for folks to start looking at. All right, well, that's all the questions we have. Thank you so much, Eric, for your great present. Oh, let's see, Someone, one just popped in. Eric, is SEC 540 different from Dev 540? I took Dev 540. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. Um, Ultimately, what happened, and if you already have taken Dev 540, you know this to be the case, we would get 30 people in the room and we'd ask, okay, how many of you are developers? And only two or three people would raise their hand and then the entire rest of the room would raise their hand and say they were on the security side of the house. So the course is the same. The title was changed to kind of uh, facilitate and match the audience that we were seeing attend the course, but they're one and the same, just a, a different tag on the top of it, if that makes sense. All right, thanks. And another one came in and I put it in your questions window because it's rather long. Uh, do you have any recommendations for using some of these concepts and processes as part of conducting an IT audit? In other words, how can someone who's not directly involved in DevSecOps but is involved in evaluating DevSecOps as part of IT audits. Apply this material, if possible. You bet. Uh, we get several auditors that take the class, and they all have that same question. And it's really, you've got to find a way to get those code-driven compliance scans, kind of that entire fourth uh, key that we talked about, embedded into the workflow. So. It may not be that you're involved in your writing and building the continuous integration jobs that perform this, but the end goal is to solve as much as your IT auditing, knowing that maybe you've got a policy that says all servers have to be CIS level one benchmark compliant, and maybe it's getting that scan inside of the build pipeline so it's always being run, and then you have access to just look at the reports when necessary or satisfy what other audit requirements you might have. So compliance, even though this doesn't really seem like something that we would do regularly, compliance has a very big part of this because the SEC part of DevSecOps is making sure we can stop systems from deploying and stop apps from deploying if they're not actually meeting your compliance requirements. So it's definitely something that should be explored and integrated, will require a lot of kind of working with the dev and the ops and the security teams to make that happen. But absolutely involvement should be kind of moving that direction. All right, we've had another one come in. First of all, someone says, awesome, Eric, thank you. Um, and then Alex asks, is SEC 540 broad enough of a course for security architects or would 545 be a better fit for the less dev focused folks? Sure, uh, you're very welcome for whoever paid the compliment there. Thanks for saying that. Uh, on the question side, so for architects in general, it kind of depends what your end goal is. Uh, as I mentioned, 545 is what I would say from the cloud perspective should be a prerequisite to taking 540 because it goes through the key services. You get a feel for their purpose, what they're doing, what they're actually going to look like. You create things in the web console and kind of see how they react. In 540, our entire focus is on automation 
in creation and management and securing those resources using DevOps automated tools. So it's probably the next level or the next progression from a courseware perspective. If architecture in the cloud is new to you, if you're just interested in the DevOps tool chain and the DevOps tools and seeing maybe from an architecture perspective, how can I learn that? Um, maybe 545 isn't required, but it, if you're new to the cloud, I would definitely say 545 would be the step one and 540 would be step two. All right, well, that's all we have. Thank you so much, Eric, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.